started. Want to welcome everybody to our spring 2021 uh, seminar series for the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. I'm Matt Helmers, director of the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Uh, this spring, we are uh, doing something a little bit different uh, in the, the last spring and um, last fall, we focused on some speakers primarily from Iowa. And so this year, um, or this spring semester, we're trying to go a little bit around the country to, to learn about what others have been doing with some, some monitoring efforts, some watershed scale project efforts. And so uh, this month uh, we have uh, Dr. Mike Daniels from University of Arkansas I'll inter introduce in a second. Um, in February, Aaron Middlestead from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, in March, Margaret Kalsik with uh, The Ohio State University. Um, tough to say the in front of that, but I will, The Ohio State University. In April, we have a, uh, Jason Hubbard uh, with West Virginia University. And then to finish it up in May, uh, Jennifer Tank from uh, Notre Dame. They'll be talking about work in Indiana. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Daniels, that's an extension prof professor for soil and water conservation with the Crop, Soils, and Environmental Sciences Department at the University of Arkansas. His research focuses on practices that reduce nutrient losses from agriculture, define and build soil health, and improve irrigation efficiency. I have uh, had the, the great pleasure of um, working with, with Mike uh, as part of the uh, Sierra 46 group. And uh, so it was, uh, we started thinking about somebody to talk about uh, watershed scale efforts and monitoring on farms. Uh, Mike uh, immediately came to mind uh, for his work with the Discovery Farm uh, program. So I will turn it over to uh, Mike to talk about reducing nutrient losses from Arkansas agriculture results from the Arkansas Discovery Farm uh, program. So welcome virtually to Iowa, Mike. Uh, you know, in a normal year, we could be you could have come up and, and been, uh, had to worry about driving in some snow, but we can, we can do this virtually. I should say, if folks have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box or uh, at the end, uh, there should be time to, for you to unmute and ask Mike questions as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thanks, Matt. The, the last time I was in Ames a couple of years ago was about this time of year and it was snowing. And, I think uh, we, I remember uh, riding in a, a little, maybe you rode in a little tiny car that Katie Flayhive was driving. She rented a car. And it, I mean, it was very, very small. I felt like we were in a covered uh, riding lawnmower, but, but we made it back to Des Moines. <laughs> that was great memories. Yeah, I want to talk and I've already, uh, I, I, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, the Iowa Nutrient Research Center and Matt and Malcolm inviting me to uh, come up and, and, uh, and virtually talk about what we're doing in Arkansas. And we've gotten to know uh, Matt and a lot of things going on. We have a tremendous amount of respect for the work going on in Iowa. Uh, we kind of see Iowa as a leader in, uh, in new approaches and things uh, 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 about how we're going to better manage nutrients. And certainly they're an integral part, or I was an integral part of our efforts uh, of those states along the Mississippi River and addressing the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia. Uh, you know, I, I really didn't have to go very far to find my first mistake on the slide. I'm sorry, today is January 27th, 2021. Nobody wants to go back to 2020. And I apologize for that. I knew it wouldn't take long to find a mistake. I wanna recognize Andrew Sharpley. Uh, Andrew's recognized worldwide as a leader in understanding the fate of phosphorus and the environment that's been derived from agriculture. Uh, it's tremendous that we were able to get him to come to Arkansas and he's just been a tremendous partner to work with. We're kind of opposites. Uh, Andrew's very prim and proper. I'm a little more rough around the edges, uh, but man, is he great to work with and so knowledgeable. And so I really wanted to, to let you know and Friday is his last day as he's retired, so. Let's move on. I, before I can go any further about uh, what we're doing with nutrient, most of it is tied in with the, uh, the Arkansas Discovery Farm Program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted you to see some of our funders. We couldn't do this program and do the amount of monitoring if we didn't have 
lots of support from a lot of different funding partners. And then we also have partners that are just very much a part of the product. I mean, the, the, the projects that we do, uh, but we've gotten federal funding, a lot of state funding. We've even gotten some private funding from groups like Anheuser-Busch, the Walton Family Foundation, um, Cotton Incorporated is one of another groups, uh, the state of Arkansas, EPA, but one of our biggest sponsors and one of the best relationships we have in our state is with NRCS. We do a tremendous amount of monitoring and, and it really worked well for our programs that came to start about the same time that uh, the healthy Mississippi Healthy River Basin Initiative or MRBI, which uh, cost shared uh, edge of field monitoring. And that's what we primarily do on our discovery farm programs. What is a discovery farm? Well, these are private farms that have volunteered to help us document the effect of conservation on water quality and quantity. Uh, they have allowed us to come out and monitor. There was a lot of concern early on. Well, what, what if EPA shows up? Uh, you know, you're not going to attract EPA. And uh, our answer was, yes, we are, but we think it's going to be good and have a good, healthy dialogue. This is Jeff Marley. I don't know if you can see me pointing at the, the picture here, but he's in the gray shirt in the middle. He's our discovery farmer for poultry. All these other people are EPA employees from either Region 6 in Dallas or from Washington, D.C., or from other parts of the country. But not only did EPA come on, come on his property, they came in masses. But they were very impressed with uh, the effort and what he's trying to do on his farm. And let me just say that when we go on these farms, we don't tell these farmers what they need to do. We ask what they want to look at in terms of monitoring nutrients. And I think that's a, a big key uh, sometimes we make suggestions, but we really don't want to know what we want to make it and give them some ownership in this program. And we started out with four farms and we've expanded to 13 now. We do a lot in eastern Arkansas with row crops, northwest Arkansas, where we have, and you can see this kind of a topological background image, but we were in the mountains up in northwest Arkansas, a lot of rocky soils, a lot of steep slopes, just not conducive to any type of Row crops were pretty much permanent pasture. That's where a lot of our poultry and beef cattle operations are focused. And then you go down past the Arkansas River that runs down through here and you get into the Ouachita Mountains. And again, we have primarily uh, poultry and beef. And then when you get down into the, our, um, our uh, uh, coastal area, uh, what used to be the, uh, the coastal Gulf Plains, uh, this is where the Gulf of Mexico actually came up, had all of Louisiana fun, uh, flooded, and, and Little Rock was actually a, 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 a port at one time. Well, it didn't exist at that time, but it would have been a port, uh, and, and that's a lot of forest land. So our eastern half, and you can see where that kind of breaks off into the Mississippi Delta, it's a very different landscape, very different, agri different agriculture. We don't integrate a lot of animal agriculture with a lot of row crop agriculture. We keep it separate. A lot of our soils in the Mississippi Delta over here, very, very poorly drained. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So why do we need the program? What, what prompted us to do this? Well, we were getting a lot of uh, questions from farmers about why is EPA and why is there so much fuss over the Gulf of Mexico and what does it mean for us? And, and even had some farmers say, go tell people that we're not the problem. And we said, you know, we can't just go do that. We've got to have some information and data. But we were also getting asked questions by people who wanted to model the entire Mississippi River Basin and set up nutrient trading programs. And they would ask us simple questions like, well, how much nitrogen do you expect to see in runoff from a, a soybean field or a cotton field? And we had no answer for it. And we realized if we were gonna help farmers, uh, we were going to have to try to do this. And, and quite honestly, we, we developed this program. We stole this idea from University of Wisconsin and their Discovery Farm program. Now, we do some things a little bit differently, but really, we, we learned from them. We took several trips up there. We even took our farmers uh, from Farm Bureau, the Environmental uh, Issues Division, uh, up to Wisconsin, let them visit with their farmers. And we came back two weeks later and met and asked them, and, we, and, and Andrew at that time, that time were thinking primarily for poultry because of all the lawsuits on poultry. But we were shocked when, when the farmers at Farm Bureau said, no, we wanna do this for all the major sectors of agriculture in Arkansas, including row crops. 
And so uh, we never really sold this program. The farmers in Wisconsin sold it to our, our programs. We also want to quantify, we need some baseline information that we've gathered over the last 10 years on nutrient and sediment loss. We need that so we can measure progress. Uh, we need to know, uh, you, you know where we stand, how big of an issue is it? Uh, we need to evaluate conservation practices and we're doing that now and we need to develop solutions. I'm gonna talk about all these things today, but to me, the most important part and at the heart of this whole program and what makes it work is that we're involving the agricultural producers in the solution process for their farm. You know, you really think about a nutrient management plan, a lot of times they're tailored to that individual farm. This is no different. Uh, and one argument I've always made to regulators and EPA is that one size doesn't fit all when you're trying to reduce nutrients. And that why would you not wanna use the producers in the solution process? They know their farm better than anybody else. Uh, and, and they know their capabilities and what they're capable. And most farmers I've worked with are very keen observers. They observe things very, very closely and they can tell you uh, a lot about what's going on in their farm. Even if they don't fully understand the terminology or the science, they've, they've watched it enough to know. And so I think that's a very important thing that we do. What do we monitor? We first started out just doing nitrogen, phosphorus and suspended solids and runoff. And obviously we were looking at the runoff volume and, and, and to do that, you know, we also wanted to look at the hydrologic inputs. Uh, let me say one thing here. We may be a little different from Iowa in the fact that we irrigate our row crops every summer. In fact, we're overdrawing our, our shallow aquifers and we were really getting the, into a critical groundwater decline. And we're trying to address some of that in, in our discovery farm programs. I'm not gonna talk about that today as much, but we do measure irrigation and precipitation. But our farmers said, we also wanna know about how we're doing as far as sustainability, because we keep hearing the supply chain uh, is going to ask us for, you know, we see this in cotton with U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. They just want farmers to document the efforts they're making in terms of conservation and put it into these sustainability metrics, which I don't know have been scientifically vetted or not, but uh, it does give them an idea of where they stand relative to their county, relative to their state, and to the other regions where they grow those crops. And then soil health became a big issue with our with one of our major partners within RCS. And uh, not only that, we had a group of farmers get together and form the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance. And some of them are our discovery farmers. And their sole purpose was try to educate and convince other farmers that they needed to be concerned about trying to improve their soil health. The, the difficult thing we're having with that and soil health is what parameters do you measure? How do you put that together? Is there one measurement that fits? We, we have not found a, a soil health test yet that's out there that tries to incorporate all the different biological, physical, and chemical properties that work very well for our soils. So we're in the process of trying to decide how that works. 10 years ago, if, you, if I would have told you, or if you would have told me we'd have been out on farms uh, measuring infiltration and talking to farmers about infiltration rates, I, I, I wouldn't have guessed it, but that's exactly what we're doing today as part of this program. This is just some of the equipment we use. We use the ISCO samplers, pretty standard in the practice. We use either a 720 uh, pressure transducer if we've got a flume where we've got it calibrated to know that the height of water or the stage of water uh, how much uh, water is going through that flume. But so much of Arkansas and Eastern Arkansas is drained in pipes through levees. The levees are put there to flood the rice. Um, and we also, when we land level, we tend to put it down in a bowl, uh, to try to capture as much water. And so they're drained through a lot of these pipes. And so we've gone with the 750 um, velocity flow meter. These are both flow modules that plug in and then help us calculate the volume of water flowing through there so that we can convert concentrations to loads. And this is just looking inside. Uh, we collect 100, 100 mil samples for each storm event. We try to get it evenly distributed underneath the hydro uh, the yeah, the hydro curve or the, the hydrograph, excuse me. Uh, and so when we get a composite sample, it's a composite or a physical average of all the water that's come under that hydrograph in one. And, and so when you get 100, 100 milliliter samples, that's 10 liters of water that you're 
your sampling out of that event. But we had to do that to save on cost. And we weren't really interested in, in studying individual storm events within the event, but we were wanting to look at it over periods of time, over the year, that sort of thing. We do measure inputs, you know, with uh, um, flow meter, irrigation flow meters. We have those hooked up to data loggers. And that's Dr. Chuck Wilson, who works with us on one of our discovery farms, downloading irrigation data uh, onto his laptop. We do a fair amount of grab sampling where we have ponds and reservoirs on those farms uh, so that we can kind of look at things. Um, this is just another shot of that. This is an irrigation reservoir for a rice farm that we work on. It's a, it's a big reservoir. And this is the only water that he has to irrigate with. He has no groundwater, it's long gone. and so. He's on the fringe of some of these uh, uh, cones of depression. Um, one, one neat thing about this reservoir is it does have alligators in it. And so you have to kind of be careful when you go out there to, to, to make sure you don't uh, uh, step on an alligator. Well, let's start looking at some of our data and some of our farms. And we got some money from the state legislature to, to establish an Arkansas discovery farm. We're, our, our acreage in cotton is down. And really a lot of guys because of economy have had to make the decision, do I grow cotton or do I grow grain? Because it's difficult to buy a cotton picker and a grain combine. But some farmers are still doing it and we still have about 500,000 acres on average of cotton. And so we picked four fields and these, these are fields that the farmer picked. We went out and said, where would you like to monitor and what would you like to look at? And so this is how our, our normal arrangement is. We pick four fields. Sometimes we compare one field to the other or we have two comparisons, or we might have one control with three, three treatments. But very rarely in this type of work do we have replicated uh, fields. We just can't uh, do everything at one time. And, and especially for doing baseline, we were more interested in knowing what was going on from the edge of field uh, than we were in necessarily starting out to do comparisons. But we did some comparisons. And if you've never seen cotton, this is what it looks like before it's ready to pick, usually in October. They fly, fly on a defoliant to cause all the leaves because cotton is not a, an, an annual plant. It's a perennial plant that we have to trick into thinking that it's an annual plant, but it's still a high value crop in Arkansas. Well, what were some of the practices that the farmer wanted us to look at? He was, he was already using uh, irrigation efficiency. Now, let me just say right here at this point, I say a lot of our soils are poorly drained in Eastern Arkansas. And so we have the same issues that you have in Iowa, and that's we've got to get rid of the water if we want to plant earlier in the year. Uh, we tend to get our, our soils when they get wet in the fall, late fall, early uh, early winter, they, they tend to stay wet until it's about time to plant. And we've really had a lot of problems with flooding over the last two or three years. It's delayed our planting, but uh, we don't do tile drainage. Our soils usually have either a pedogenic uh, a layer that keeps water from moving downward, or we have a, uh, 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 it's, it's been impacted by uh, uh, compaction. And, and so we don't get water to, and that's one reason we can grow rice so well, is that we don't have to worry about water uh, going down past six inches. We can flood up six inches of soil and then put, hold a flood on top of it. And we know we're not, that the water's not gonna move downward. So tile drainage isn't an option for us, but what we do is we do an awful lot of land leveling where we say, shape the surface through a process of cut and fill to where we put in a uniform slope. And a lot of times that slope is very small. It might be a 10th of a foot over a hundred feet, but it's just enough to have the water and have gravity help pull it out of the field. And I'll talk about the importance of that and why it may work to our advantage uh, in, in our row crop area. He also was looking at fertilizer efficiency. Uh, he was already knifing liquid uran as his nitrogen source for both corn and uh, 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 cotton. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And he really did, wasn't worried about soil health, didn't want to get into it. He was already doing minimum till. But we have a problem, and this is a lot of farmers decided that they needed to, to start looking at cover crops because we were having so much uh, resistance to weeds, especially Palmer amaranth and pigweed. And at least cover crops were giving them uh, some suppression of, of pigweed. So he started in cover crops. And today he'll tell you the most important thing we've done for him is help improve his soil health and get water deeper in the profile where he can minimize or, or optimize his irrigation to where he's much more efficient with his irrigation. Now this irrigation efficiency up here is that 
we've gone away from pivots with this land leveling and we found that we can just roll out a uh, 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 flat pipe and, and uh, use this uh, poly pipe. Uh, the problem was is that you had to punch a hole for each furrow because we do a lot of furrow irrigation down the slope. And, you know, length, uh, uh, the length of these slopes, not every field is perfectly square. So some of these rows were much longer than others. So the short rows would water out very quickly and the others wouldn't, or sometimes there was just some reason they wouldn't. This all helps uh, 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 equalize the pressure for each one of those holes for each furrow so that we water out the end basically at the same time. And it's been a big push to use in our state. And we'll talk about the irrigation and what we found in comparison to, not, uh, uh, to rainfall events. This is some of the problems with poly pipe. You get uneven water distribution. Uh, it really increases water runoff. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important that we, 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 for two reasons, but it does affect nutrient runoff. And I'll show some data from that. But uh, it used to, when they turned this on and they didn't have these holes set right, it would just blow this pipe up and then you'd have a leak and it was just a mess. But over the years, we've really gotten this down and we have this nice computer program that helps us size those holes. One thing we noticed very quickly on this farm in cotton was that the water looked a little bit differently coming off after a rainfall event than it did at irrigation. The irrigation, it didn't have nearly as much, um, uh, uh, it wasn't nearly as turbid as, as that. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but we noticed that right off, but looks can be deceiving. It wasn't in this case, but we know in doing water quality monitoring, uh, just the clarity of the water itself doesn't tell the whole story sometimes. It does maybe from a sediment standpoint. <clears throat> like I said, he really, once we started with, uh, with cover crops, our farmer there really got excited about it and started planting to standing cover crops. And this is what it would look like a little bit better, uh, differently. I mean, a little bit later on, once he planted, has a good cover there, really good for weed suppression. Uh, what we're finding, cereal rise a great uh, biological plow with depth and it's opening up that soil profile. And we're not just farming six inches anymore. We're farming 18 to 24 inches now. And that's affected our water need. It's also slowed the water down. Uh, and we thought that might have, it didn't have quite as big an impact as we thought in reducing nutrient losses um, during the growing season, but it has slowed that water down. This is just a picture he went out and took uh, about, oh, I don't know, it was in December after a three inch rain and he had a field that was no till with a with no cover. Uh, let me, uh, hold on a second, I made a mistake there. I gotta move my little bar for, yeah. He had no till uh, with cover crop, uh, no till, no cover crop. I know that looks like a cover crop, but that's just weeds that will come up in Arkansas because of some of our temperatures that we have during the winter. This is the cover crop field. You can see much more uniformity, but after that rain, there was still water standing in between the furrows, nothing in the cover crop side. It had taken all that up and he was, farmer was very impressed. Now the harder thing is, is you can see this, but as a scientist to quantify this and, and to see if there's a real difference, it's a lot tougher. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the runoff here. We had over different events. We got started a year later on this one field. Uh, we had some issues, but these were a number of events we had. And one thing you'll notice very quickly is if you look at the standard deviation, in a lot of cases, it's, it's as equal or even double in some cases what the mean is and which told us that the data was skewed. And, and, and we know that when you're dealing with hydrological parameters, that's the case. And so we always like to use the medium, but for all the all these different events, we saw that about a third to uh, a, you know almost half an inch of water every time we get a runoff event was what we were seeing. But we can have some large runoff events. You know, in one field we had over five inch runoff event, um, and you can see the minimum is sometimes just barely detectable in terms of inches for that field. But you know, I just wanted to give you an idea of what our runoff events look like. Now, I just wanted to kind of run through one field that we, when we started this back in 2013, but I just wanted to show you what we were finding in terms of total N and total P. And of course, what we're measuring with total N and total P is the organic fraction. And also uh, a lot of times it may be tied to a soil or maybe uh, 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 plant materials. 
but nonetheless, it's not the soluble form. But you know, I started presenting the soluble form, and I had some people saying, "Well, but that's not telling us. We want to see total." So these were on the total. These were sampling dates. This is when he fertilized. He does not. Steve likes to knife his nitrogen in, and you can see we use. Uh, he uses about did about 20 pounds of broadcast because he puts on diammonium phosphate to put his phosphorus on. So he does broadcast a little nitrogen, but most of it is being incorporated and knifed in. And a lot of farmers say, oh, it's just too much work to knife that in. But we do think it makes a difference. Uh, and so you can see we don't use a lot of, uh, compared to corn, you know, we don't use a lot of uh, nitrogen and cotton. Cotton will grow and will not go reproductive and stay vegetative if you put too much nitrogen on it. So here's where you put the, uh, the fertilizer on. You can see we had some elevated nitrogen right after those events, but then that kind of died off. But the, and so we, we feel like, you know, the, 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 for lack of a better terms, the, the cotton plant was pretty competitive in holding those nutrients in place and not letting them move with the runoff water. But these are all the irrigation events. Now this was the one thing and he, Steve had never, the farmer had never seen data like this. We got a big rainstorm at the end of September and we were already past where you add any more fertilizer, any more water, anything. We call it cutout, but the crop is developed. We're just now letting it mature. We're not putting any more uh, fruit structures on there or cotton bowls. And so he was really disturbed by this. It's only 0.1, it looks so much bigger compared to these other things. He reduced his nitrogen rate after that on this field or felt like he should. And I, I told him that was not our decision to make. But, uh, you know, he didn't want any nitrogen left in his fields after the growing season. And then in 2014, he was able to get out a little earlier. Then here's where he fertilized. But this year it was in corn. And so he put out, you know, a lot more, two and a half times more nitrogen for our corn than we put out for cotton. So we really raised the rate. But if you look, the losses are still in that same range, less than uh, they weren't early on. I mean, we got some good rainfall. We tend to lose more during rainfall than we do irrigation uh, early after broadcast. I mean, early after, not broadcast, but early after um, uh, putting the fertilizer out. And, uh, but again, these are numbers are not very big compared to the amount that we put out. And I'll summarize that for you a little bit more in a minute. But, and, and one thing I will say is one thing we recognized is that even though we put more fertilizer out for the corn two and a half times, we didn't see two and a half times the increase. So the, the relative loss was about the same in terms of a percentage loss. Um, now we, we, we went back and in, in 2015, here's this fertilizer. Again, we, had a, we didn't lose that much in irrigation right afterwards, but we had five inches of rain, or I'm excuse me, seven inches of rain from July 2nd, July 5th. And that one event, just dominated our losses throughout the growing season. And you hear about, well, you know, 80% of the nutrient loss in the watershed was uh, from 20% from of, uh, 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 of the events. And that's kind of what we're seeing at edge of field too. Again, in 2016, uh, you know, he doesn't put any fertilizer out until he's sure he has a stand. And so it, that's gonna vary when he puts it out. He doesn't go by calendar, he goes by conditions. He, we got good rainfall distribution, but look what happened. We got another big rainfall events in August, and, and, and but these numbers are very small, but they're big relative to the other events. And so we started to see a pattern, and I hope you're seeing it too. Sometimes we get these big, big rainfall events, and that seems to be when we're losing it compared to the irrigation. Uh, and just one more year's worth of data where he did some... Uh, 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 splitting of his, uh, of, his, of his fertilizer. He put some out early for some reason, and then he came back, put some out, and put out some more in June. It was just the way that it unfolded weather patterns and stuff. We lost some right after we put it out due to rainfall. Look at this, big, big losses from rainfall, not so big from irrigation. Well, we did run some uh, statistics and look at some comparisons and we did it on, the fields weren't, the, the aim of the study was not to compare the fields and, and they weren't really reps, but we studied what was going on and compared what was going on throughout the season. During the growing season, we wanted to look, what's our difference in irrigation? 
in, in our nutrients and was there a difference uh, in, in precipitation? So really what these numbers are looking at is comparing, are, are we losing more during irrigation, uh, precipitation events during the growing season compared to the irrigation events? And now this one's a non-growing season and that's really when we would have the covers out there and we only had precipitation, but we wanted to compare that to these other scenarios. And what we found is that when you have covers and when you're doing irrigation during the growing season, there's not much, there's not any statistical difference, but they're both significantly lower than uh, that produced by precipitation during the growing season. So something about the impact of that rainfall and, and, and something, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but. Uh, we also say this, it's all the same term for toluene, and this is on concentration, and Andrew's a chemist. He's a soil chemist. He likes concentration. I'm more of a soil physicist. I like uh, the mass loading or pounds per acre. Look what happens. We saw these differences in concentration. They did not translate to load differences, okay? Uh, even though there was a source and the difference in the source, the hydrology was so different that it, it, it wiped out. There's so much variability, I think, in hydrology. It wiped out these differences. You don't see them. And that was true for all these fields. And we saw some, some slight differences between the irrigation and precipitation events. Uh, and two of the three fields, they were different um, that, that we looked at. So it was kind of neat to learn that irrigation, we do see significant differences from uh, the precipitation events. And we do with the, uh, uh, the row crop, I mean, with the cover crops, um, but, but only in the concentration, not in the, the loading. Well, if you look at the phosphorus, the same thing that we looked at, we did see a difference in the losses were much less, significantly less in irrigation than they were in the precipitation events. Uh, but that, that carried through to the loadings too. So uh, I, I don't know the explanation. Some of y'all may have it, but certainly the idea of reporting in, in, in concentration or, or adjusting for the, the amount of runoff, uh, we certainly had to take a look at that. And, and, uh, but we did see those. So it was interesting that nitrogen didn't and phosphorus did. But the same type of trends there for phosphorus um, you know, we did see, the, the one thing we didn't see as much in the phosphorus is the effect of the cover crops. And, you know, I think when we terminate the cover crops, get the phosphorus up out of the ground into the plant and we can get past decay in the spring in Arkansas with warm, moist conditions that we're releasing, maybe releasing some of that phosphorus. Uh, we don't know for sure. We know that happens under where you get a lot of freezing and thawing cycles, but maybe it's happening under our conditions too. And we don't have that many freezing and thawing cycles in this part of the southern part of the state. Well, that's it for cotton. And let me run through rice real quick. Uh, rice is a unique crop that we flow it. We, 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 we grow it under flooded conditions, although because of our water situation, more and more people are wanting to try what we call row rice or furrow irrigation of rice. But this, on this farm, and I showed you the reservoir earlier, he irrigates out of the reservoir. So we can sample the reservoir, and we did before we started watering. And then he uses that water, and he has what we call a zero grade. It's just formed like a bathtub with no grade in it. Fills up like a bathtub, and it's, but you can probably, the, the thing, it's very expensive to do this, to landform this way, but it does save on water. But the problem is you, you really can't rotate any other crops in there because you have no drainage unless you pull the plug on that thing. Uh, and most crops you don't want uh, flooded, but rice we do. And then we have this precision graded where, where they've taken out all the, they, they've made this nice uniform slope through land leveling. And then we had the, the contour levy rice, uh, which means they follow, they follow the contours, they're not land leveled. And to get the flooding depth right, they have to have the levees closer together a lot of times. And then we had one cornfield that was on a precision graded field and we thought this would be much higher. But look, in all these situations, the water coming at the bottom of the field was lower concentration than what was entering through the irrigation water. And so we really know, and we kind of, we, we really knew kind of going in that rice acts as a construction, constructed wetland, a short-term constructed wetland is, and can be a nutrient sink. Uh, and we're showing that for phosphorus. We didn't know that it might happen in, 
uh, in a corn crop that's not flooded conditions. But then we also looked at nitrogen. And so we, we basically, once we started to put the nitrogen out, as soon as we get the nitrogen out, we start flooding up our rice fields. So as soon as it was flooded enough that we could put a, a sampler in there and pull a sample out, we started sampling every hour on the hour of the first day, uh, you know, 24 samples in the first day, 12 in the second and on down. And then we went out to two weeks. And, and what we saw was that we had a very rapid drop in that flood water in terms of the nutrient or nitrogen, total nitrogen concentration and also the nitrate concentration, but uh, it goes down and, and it sets at about two mil, milligrams per liter. And we get, and of course, if you go back a slide, that's 14 days after flooding, but several weeks after you first flood it, when you go to drain that crop to harvest it, we were down, you know, down much lower levels uh, than that. So it, it keeps going slowly down in rice. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not, a, I, I put the wrong slide in there. That was phosphorus. We can't compare it to the nitrogen, obviously, but uh, this, we did drop off. And then I do have showing the nitrogen is even much lower than that at the time we go to drain that flood water. At, at harvest, so several, maybe six, six to eight weeks after we put this out there uh, for the rice crop. Now, we also did some work on soybeans and looked at how irrigation, uh, uh, how we put the water on uh, affects some things. And uh, so we did this paired comparison where we have the surge valve. On one side, we didn't have a surge valve. So we just put the entire well capacity spread out across half that field. And I'll show you a diagram that's gonna make that look a little bit. And then on the other side, we use the surge valve to flip back and forth so that we can send water down these rows, uh, slow it down, let it soak in, flip to the other side. And, and we find that, that that can reduce runoff. And so we, we wanted to see if, if that would happen on this field. So here you have your surge valve and you have one line running out that does this quarter of this field you have this other line coming out and does a quarter of this uh, of that half. So half of that half and they flip flop. And it's the art there is how, how, where do you set the timer? How many hours to let it flip flop? And you just got to play around with that to do that. And then over here, we didn't have the surge valve. And so this whole half of the field drained. And what did we find doing that? Well, this is just a setup showing you we had flow meters measuring the side where we didn't have the, the, the surge valve and then we had a flow meter tied in to where we did have the surge valve. We learned the hard way, you've got to have a long straight pipe, solid pipe. Uh, it just can't handle that pressure because you do have that surge valve in the line. And so, uh, but anyway, this alternates back and forth. And what we found, we, we actually put more water on the surge valve side because this on a real farm and under real situation, he was going to irrigate this non-surge valve, non-surge side, and he had a rain come up, so he stopped his irrigation. So we actually put more irrigation out. But if you look at the tailwater loss, uh, it was cut in half by the surge valve. So we're not getting as much runoff uh, from this. Now, on this farm, we collect a lot of this water and reuse it in, in our tailwater recovery ditches. But uh, the fact of the matter is, a lot of fields that don't have tailwater, that water is lost to a stream, probably goes on down the White River in this location uh, to the Mississippi River and then to the Gulf. Uh, we can kind of get an effective irrigation uh, and an efficiency if we take the irrigation, divide it by the tailwater or minus the tailwater loss and divide it by the total amount of irrigation. Look at our efficiency. Only about half the water was actually staying in the field and this one at least about 80% was. And then if you take that and realize, hey, a lot of that water didn't stay in the field, even though we put more water out, we got five more inches in that field than we did with an O-surge. And so we can save water that way. And by saving the water and runoff, ah, look at this, we reduced the nutrients. Now these were low losses. This is in pounds per acre, very low losses, but, it did cut it in half. And so uh, I think if we were in a situation where we were seeing higher losses, uh, then we might, we might uh, uh, see an issue there. I wanna switch now and go to some of our livestock farms. And, and this is Jeff Marley, our farmer. This was a pond that was built to have the material to build these pads to put his chicken houses on. 
And he's always wondered, well, what effect does the exhaust of the blowing the, the exhaust, these big exhaust fans that blow out of the, and, and, and control the airflow in these farms, you can see dust building up under this. And you always wonder, is that dust containing nutrients? And is it getting into my pond here? Uh, they use that pond for a lot of fishing, duck hunting, a lot of different things. And he, he, he doesn't want that to uh, be harmed in any way. And so, but this is our poultry farm. This is how it's laid out. There's the, what was dug out to create these pads to put these on. And then there's got four more houses over here. And here's a creek that drains directly into the West Fork of the White River. And so, and that's about a mile downstream from his farm. And so he was very sensitive to losing any nutrients to the White River. He's on the Beaver Lake Watershed Alliance board. And so that White River flows into Beaver Lake and provide some of the drinking water, uh, provides drinking water over 5, 500,000 people in Northwest Arkansas. And so we put the first flume here to see what was coming off these houses. And then we put some over here. And then one practice is we wanted to see how good of a sink the pond would be for nitrogen and phosphorus. And over here, we took this out of grazing. We took it out of hay production. I'm sorry, we didn't take it out of hay production. We did take it out of grazing. And we rented this part and we put a flume here. And then we wanted to see what this grass unmanaged grass filter strip would do, uh, how much reduction could we get from that? And so here's a runoff flow coming from these houses to this. It goes through two, it's released. It goes through this filter strip to flume three. And then this is the drainage area for here and then the drainage area going to, to that one. And let's just look at some of the differences that we saw. First, if, let's look at the, uh, Flume two and flume three, you can see that we had quite a bit of decrease uh, in, in our nutrients uh, from flume two to flume three on the same events. And we had 30% reduction in flow. So we were getting an infiltration of that water out into this filter strip, a, a rather long filter strip. But nonetheless, it did show it was effective. And then if you look at the pond, and that was our flume that we had set up there. Again, we got quite a bit of reduction. Now, the pond overflows sometimes and flows on down to other parts of its pasture, uh, but it does act as a sink for phosphorus and for nitrogen too, but it's not gonna be an infinite sink, although there is a cycling of evaporation and then the rainfall coming in, so that may delay, delay some of it, but we don't anticipate it being uh, an infinite sink, and at some point we're worried about it you for eutrophication from the excess phosphorus. Uh, but you can see the kind of percentage that we got over the, the years uh, in the flow and the total P and N from plume two to three. But it can be a little bit deceiving when you look at over average over four years, because we had a very wet year in 2016, so wet that our grass filter strip actually uh, we saw increased flow, not, not a decrease in flow. We didn't see a, an increase in phosphorus because these are still uh, reductions, but nitrogen, we saw an increase, not a decrease, we saw an increase. So that, that, that flow got to the source of nitrogen and interacted with it uh, a, a little bit more during that really high uh, period of rainfall during that, that monitoring season. Well, what have we learned from all these things? And uh, I wanted to show you another livestock farm, but I just don't have time and can't show everything. I to use this lighthouse as, what did we find that can guide us to the next iteration of what we're trying to do to help farmers reduce nutrients? Well, let's just look at the pounds per acre per year and that applied. Uh, we're losing on corn on average about 1.7 pounds per acre per, per year. Uh, and that's about 1.5% of what we've applied as fertilizer. Cotton's a little bit higher, uh, but quite honestly, we've had a lot more data from cotton than we've had from corn. Pasture, you see, is in, it can be an order of magnitude less, which we might expect because uh, we, we tend to have better infiltration in our pastures than we do in our grow crop land. Um, and 
soybeans, at, at some of our, at one of our sites was, oh, in the same range as our in between cotton and corn. So just to relevant, we're not losing much. Usually in around less than 5% of the nutrients that we're putting on as fertilizer, we're recovering during that water year afterwards, uh, which we think is really good. I mean, you don't want to lose anything, but, but really in a natural system, biological system like this to be less than 5% loss is a pretty high efficiency in terms of uh, your fertilizer efficiency. And if you wanted to look at it on a concentration standpoint, how these different row crops, uh, rice again is a little bit lower than our other crops in terms of concentration. But again, we think that works as a nutrient sink because of the flooded conditions. We know that some of the conservation practices decrease nutrient runoff, but some of the things we've learned too is that we can have these large storm events that actually override our conservation practices and we see a decreased effectiveness. So to assume the same effectiveness from year to year is probably a tough assumption, but sometimes we have to make those type of assumptions, but, but certainly we've been seeing that. So there is annual variability in our conservation practice effectiveness. We see a lot of variability from storm event to storm event. Uh, <laughs> measured losses, we've had people up, let me back up. We've had people look at these, uh, you, you know, predicting losses, and this is what they predict uh, in pounds per acre per year to try to set up trading uh, scenarios for water quality and, and with farm sites. And, and this is what we're finding. And so we're finding much less than what the models are predicting. So somewhere we have a disconnect that we've got to figure out um, uh, what's the difference. Some of the difference is, quite honestly, is we're talking about a scale difference, edge of field as compared to uh, a watershed uh, basis. But, and, and trying to define that continuum, continuum to me is the biggest challenge we face in this area. How do we know, when we know what's coming off the field, how do we know uh, its fate and, and, and what it means to that receiving stream? Well, one thing we did, and, and, and I think a lot of things, we know the hydrology has a lot of influence uh, on our losses. And I said I talked about us doing this irrigation. And why was the irrigation different from the rainfall? It's not all about particle detachment and all of that. Uh, I think what it is is a lot of times we're we're running very uh, low grade furrows. You know, our fields may be a half mile long. We may be trickling irrigation down a half mile long, at less than one percent slope. And there's just not the energy in that irrigation water to pick up as much stuff and carry it with it as there would be when you instantaneously fill up that, that uh, furrow with rainfall. You get that impact, and, but then you get a lot bigger uh, 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 velocity of that rainfall and energy associated with that rainfall running off than we do with our just trickling water down those flows. So I think those long, long flat rows that we have actually aid us in, in nutrient reduction especially when it comes to irrigation, not always true uh, with the rainfalls we've seen from some of our data. But I found this interesting, and this is hard data to get at because you've got to get a lot of different data points. Uh, so these are seasonal runoff. So this is seasonal runoff. Uh, and this is how the losses that we had during that seasonal runoff from planting to harvest. And so it takes years to get this type of enough data to run a regression through it. And this is all for cotton that we did there, the total nitrogen, nitrate, nitrate. And I thought we had pretty good fit that it, that it expressed itself pretty well linearly. That is, if we increase runoff, we're gonna increase our losses if the source is there. And apparently we had enough source, we're still source rich that we haven't got into where these, these curves will start bending back over because of dilution. So we, we're not there yet either. Even when we have 30 centimeters of runoff, 35 centimeters of runoff during a growing season. And it was even better expressed with phosphorus, both the soluble reactive phosphorus and total phosphorus uh, that, that we had pretty good linear fit. And we're not close to where we're gonna get dilution, but where the runoff is, the runoff volume is so great that we actually, so we're still in this source rich area uh, of, of the nutrients. So this is some data that we, and some things, but it takes a long time to get to this because each field and each year was a data point in itself to get to this. So get to enough site years where you feel comfortable running the regression 
it takes it takes a lot of work and effort and time. Uh, it's more than collecting data. And I, I think this is Steve Stevens, one of our discovery farmers. He does as much extension work now as we do. He's get, he gets called all the time to come talk about what he's found on his farm. And he's our extension farmer. He talks at a lot of different things. I've had people ask me, well, where is he? We don't, we can't find him on your website. What, 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 what is he a professor of? And, and we tell him, no, he's a farmer, but he's, he's one that once we gave him the data, he wanted to know as much about it as he could. And he's, he's been the best at taking this type of data and refining his management systems based on the integrated effect of, of seeing what's in the runoff. We've had a lot of different tours. We get called all the time for tours. This is our, our U.S. Senator, John Bozeman. Bozeman, he called us one day out of the blue and said, we want to come out and see what all this is about on the discovery farms. And so that, you know, that's one of those you kind of say, oh, geez, uh, didn't expect we were going to get U.S. senators out here. But uh, he, he was very complimentary of what we do. This one was uh, Jason Weller. Uh, he he uh, was, was the chief of NRCS at one time. He kept hearing about good things. And so but I think the biggest thing about these things, it isn't about us. It isn't about us as science or our science. What it's really about is our farmers getting to interact with people they think uh, want to regulate them. This was Chief Pruitt, the administrator for EPA, uh, came to Arkansas and met with Terry Dads, one of our discovery farmers, Steve Stevens, Farm Bureau, our US attorney, I'm sorry, I'm sorry our state attorney general, uh, and, and you'll see in Steve's hand, he's got a folder. That's the data we collected from his farm that he brought with it and handed to him and said, you know, I have data showing what I'm doing and what kind of performance and where we've had to make changes. And I, I, two weeks later, I got a request from, from my director or from my vice president saying, EPA wants to report on all the things y'all are finding. And so, uh, and then this was, uh, this was the farmer set this up, uh, Administrator Wheeler, I didn't have anything to do with this, but he was an outgoing EPA chief uh, from Washington, but he actually came down and came to the Discovery Farm and made a big announcement that they gave this, the state some money to do some environmental work. And uh, there's Terry Dabbs that invited him. He just happened to pass him in the past, this gentleman, the, re, the Region 6 EPA administrator in the hall down in Dallas one day, invited him to his farm. And that was back like in February. And then he called in, in November and said, yeah, we want to come see your farm. And so he brought out the chief EPA administrator that, that got on our farm and uh, was looking at what we were doing. And, and all of our farmers ask is just to be able to have a chance to tell their story. And I think when you get them out on the farms and they see what's going on, they see some of the challenges, but they see the effort and determination that farmers are making in terms of, of trying to protect water. I think they're very impressed with that. I just wanted to make a plug real quick before I get done that we are doing a virtual shop uh, uh, shop talks for farmers from all around the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, the only speakers you'll hear on this are farmers that uh, uh, have been invited to speak. It's free and open to all farmers. You just need to register and you can register at this uh, HTTP. Well, you can read that there, virtual shop talks. Uh, we're going to have four of them, and we got farmers that are going to talk about this, and then they're going to have breakout sessions so farmers can talk to different farmers and learn from each other. So uh, that's I, I just wanted to bring that up because those are open to farmers in Iowa, Arkansas, all along the Mississippi River Basin. If you want more information on Discovery Farms, there's our website. We're on Facebook. Uh, I guess that's Instagram and Twitter. So. Uh, we do have a social media presence there. With that, I'll take any questions, but I really thank Matt and others uh, for this opportunity. I hope I've left some time for questions. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. Yeah, we have time for, for some questions. Uh, we had one come in. I have a couple questions too. And I mean, it's really, I think it's really interesting to see uh, the differences in some of the farming practices. You know, as we think about the Mississippi River Basin, some of the differences from from what we have in Iowa to what you have in, in Arkansas and some of the diversity. So I, two questions I had were, you know, uh, as a result of some of this work and, and uh, monitoring on these farms, you know, are, are some farmers changing their practices? Are we getting adoption? And then has, has that monitoring work been used? You showed that about comparing uh, SWAT apex to the, to the measured data. 
uh, are people using your information to improve those model predictions, kind of calibrate and verify ag against that? Uh, they are because some of, so much of that data we've collected has been funded by NRCS 201 and 202 program. Uh, and we have to send in reports and they use those reports to, to, uh, to try to calibrate some of the models that, that NRCS uses. Uh, we have not worked, we have done a little bit of work with the SWAT team down in Texas. Uh, we need to do more, quite honestly, they've asked for it. Um, actually the field to market team asked for a lot of our data and they wanted to use it to calibrate models to see how well, how scientifically valid some of the indicators for sustainability are. So yeah, we're, we're getting uh, asked for that data. The, the only thing we ask is that it, whose data is it? We always consider it the farmer's data. We want permission from the farmers to use it. We won't publish anything until the farmer says, yes, you can publish it. So, but we do have a very liberal Freedom of Information Act. We just, no one's, everybody, this program has really been received as positive. Uh, it's just blown us away about how positive people have been about this program. And so uh, yeah, a, I, I'm sorry, Matt, I forgot your first question. Well, that's, that's okay. In fact, I mean, that, I guess that, so the farmers have been willing to share their data. They have been our, be our best spokesman. We just, I, I think it's more effective sometimes. Oh, you asked about adoption. We know it's a lot more, uh, 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 we're seeing a lot more adoption of cover crops and people like Steve Stevens saying, hey, I've got data to show you where it's uh, re reducing nutrients and runoff. Although it's the, 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 the statistics weren't as great as, as uh, we thought it might be, but, but the fact of the matter is he really believes that it's really helped his overall system getting roots down, cotton roots down much deeper and using nutrients from lower in the profile. And uh, uh, he's reduced some of his nitrogen rates on cotton. So yes, we're seeing some of these guys, uh, a, a lot of them, especially on the irrigation, they see a lot of benefits to what we're doing to help them with irrigation. Not, know that, not necessarily from the nutrient runoff, but just from the amount of water that they have to use. I didn't put it in perspective, but if y'all have ever been, I think they've blown it up and imploded it now, but uh, I've been to the Minnesota Metrodome and I was having to speak to uh, dairy farmers in Minnesota because they are having some groundwater issues in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. But to put it in perspective, how much water we use in the 25 counties of the Arkansas Delta, you can strip everything outside the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Metrodome so that you have all that volume for storage of water and we would need 18 of those. Uh, and we would use, we would have to fill them up daily to meet our daily demand of irrigation water. So you can see, we just have a tremendous need to conserve water. But I think what we're finding is when we put those practices in that reduce runoff, we can reduce nutrient losses. And even though we're having very low losses, we haven't gotten to that inflection point where we see dilution. Okay, there was a question here about whether um, that livestock farmer upstream from the drinking utility, whether they forged any sorts of partnerships or relationships with the utility. Yeah, he's on their board of directors. He's been on, the, they have a farmer advisory board. Uh, people don't realize this, but their largest uh, uh, customer for their water, Beaver Lake Water District, are poultry farmers in the poultry industry. And so we don't have groundwater at very close to the surface up in Northwest Arkansas, a lot of karst topography, much deeper wells. And so it's just easier for them to, to go off uh, 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 rural water supplies or, and, and they're looking for ways to save water too, but they have to have a pretty good uh, quality of water because they use cardboard cooling fins. Um, and those things will get, that, that's how they cool their houses. And those things will get clogged up if you have a lot of dissolved constituents in your water. And so, uh, yeah, they have formed, we, we actually are looking at doing our first discovery watershed with the Beaver Lake Water District up in Northwest Arkansas to look at it, all this, trying to monitor individual fields, but then see what that means at the outlet of a small watershed. And we chose, we chose that area because of the activity of these uh, of, of watershed groups up there, but also we can define those watersheds so much easier than we can in Eastern Arkansas where it's so flat. And I had a professor tell me back in college, you know, you could back up water for miles in the Arkansas Delta by just placing a two by four in the right place. <laughs> well, 
that's so. a, yeah, that's a good one. All right. Are there some questions from uh, any of the attendees? We got, uh, I read the one that came in and uh, any other questions? You're welcome to unmute and, and ask Mike a question if so. Well, Matt, I think one of the things point you make is every time I go to Iowa or Wisconsin or Minnesota and see what they're doing, I learn something that's applicable or at least helps me understand why we don't do it back in Arkansas. There is a lot of differences. The big difference is we don't pile drain it, but we still have that same need of drainage. We just have to do it all by surface drainage. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to see the kind of the, the nutrient loss from those rice fields. Or, or lack or how low it was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, you know, Michelle Reba with ARS is doing some of the same type of work and she's in a different part of the state where they haven't done quite as much land leveling. Mm. And she has actually found that you can get a, a pretty good significant nitrogen loss right after you flood up. If you get a big rainfall that produces a lot of runoff, but in a lot of these land level fields, they've engineered it to where they don't lose water, you know, over the top of those levees to flooding or anything. They keep that water in the field because they want to capture all the water they can from rainfall. They don't have to use irrigation water to keep those fields flooded. You but I would say from an edge of field monitoring standpoint, it's much different, much more difficult to monitor rice than any other right. problem. Yeah. I think Dan had a question. I do. You mentioned that a lot of your livestock operations were up in sort of a pasture land area. Does that mean a lot of the litter ends up on pasture or is it moved to other crop fields? Well, Daniel, that's a great question. It's something we've wrestled with for years. The problem has always been because our poultry litter contains about 30% moisture by weight. It makes it very cumbersome and expensive to try to transport it to where our crop fields are. Most of the litter being exported out of Northwest Arkansas is actually going to Kansas and to Oklahoma for crop fields not to Arkansas. Uh, we do have uh, some, a new uh, poultry company that's come in and established themselves in Northeastern Arkansas where they're real close to the cropland. And that's gonna be going in, you know, more and more litter will be going there. But Northwest Arkansas, a lot of it has returned to pasture land and that's been their sole source of fertilizer. And we just got our soil test phosphorus up, um, you know, well over, you know, in a lot of cases over a thousand parts per million. And, and that's not an exaggeration. And that's because we were putting it out for nitrogen based the litter, even though it has about the same amount of phosphorus. In fact, once you account for uh, ammonia volatilization, when you're putting out the litter, you're probably putting more phosphorus on than you are nitrogen. So if you meet the nitrogen rate, you're putting way too much phosphorus on. And over the 20 year, 30 year period, you've built that soil test phosphorus up to where, uh, you know, we had lawsuits against us from the state of Oklahoma, from the city of Tulsa, all of our water drains west up there to Oklahoma, and, and they don't appreciate us adding a little phosphorus to it. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's been an ongoing thing. It's, and really, Andrew Sharpley was intrigued by that and came to us to work on developing a better Arkansas P index for pastures to where now we don't put it, we don't, the state does not allow poultry farmers to put out litter without a, a certified a nutrient management plan written by a certified planner, and it has to be based on the P index, which is a lot lower application rates, which has caused a lot of farmers to move their, you know, find a way to move their litter off farm. They don't have enough farmland um, to, to use all that, that P. I just wish we'd have caught it much earlier in the process. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we are at four. So I want to, uh, again, thank Mike for, uh, for uh, sharing some of the work that's been done as part of the Discovery Farms in Arkansas. I think it's very, very uh, interesting. It's great that you've been able to get, uh, you know, the producers so engaged in wanting that level of monitoring done, done on their farms. I think that's something, um, you know, that, that's very helpful and, and good for understanding how their management uh, impacts water. So. Um, if we were all in the same space, I'd uh, ask folks to, uh, to thank Mike. A uh, round of applause for, for Mike for the presentation. Um, then he'd have to have a long trip back to Arkansas. But thanks a lot, Mike. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Hopefully, you'll be able to attend um, at the end of um, the fourth week in, in February uh, for our next uh, monthly, monthly seminar for this 
this semester. So thanks everybody. Have a great day. And well, Matt, uh, let me just okay. say one thing. Thank you all. I, I really appreciate y'all being uh, willing to come listen to me today. And I really appreciate the invitation. And if you're ever in Arkansas and want to see the Discovery Farm, look me up. We do tours all the time. We'll, we'll do a tour for you.